Information about the world of running, inspiration to fuel passion and excellence, and ideas for making connections and finding community. You're listening to A to Z Running. Hi, running friends. We're back for another episode of A to Z Running. I'm Zach. And I'm Andy. We are talking this week about data and being yes. data driven. <laughs> Zach is super excited. Yes. (laughs) We apologize in advance. Zach is a little under the weather and has a cold. I'm auditioning for a new role in a Hollywood movie that requires gravelly voice. (laughs) It does sound kind of cool, but um, he might not sound as excited as he actually is. So know that as we go into the world of running. I'm not wearing hockey pads. You're having way too much fun with that. I'm Batman. Let's get right into the world of running. So there has been a lot of buzz in the running world lately, uh, all to do with Mary Kane. And it has been, I think, a really great conversation, a lot of high emotions. And I'm sure it was very difficult for her to make the statements that she's made regarding her treatment um, with Nike when she was with them. For those of you that don't know Mary Kane, she is has been an incredible athlete starting at a very young age. There's a lot of expectation, a lot of excitement because Mary Kane started her running career pretty early on. And yeah, I mean, she basically broke all the high school records for distance runners at the time. Yeah, fastest girl in America is what New York Times has named her, and she is based on her times, or was based on her times, and she had a hard time. She she got injured. She suffered a lot of stress because of the pressure that she was facing at Nike and didn't receive holistic treatment uh, there. No one really paid attention to her well-being as a, as a whole person. And I think that conversation has spurred on some really good thoughts as it pertains to young athletes. And actually, athletes in general, we're a whole person, not just a running machine. And in high-intensity situations... There's going to be a lot that's that's going to go on in our emotions as well as in our physical bodies. And to have the additional pressure of needing to be thin, that was also a component. So a lot of prominent athletes in the sport have reached out to her. Shailene wrote a really nice post apologizing her for not reaching out when she saw her struggling. And I think that Mary Kane being vulnerable like this no matter what you want to pick at it, because I guess there was some additional comments that were made by the New York Times. But all all to say, I think it's really important as these kinds of things come up to move the conversation in a positive direction. And I think it definitely has been going there with the topic of holistic treatment, especially of women. Yeah. And I think the, the big message with this is uh, we, sir, so we don't know exactly all the things, you know, that go on or that went on. Um, and there's certainly we see opportunity time and time again for people to perceive a thing that wasn't necessarily what was you know happening um, in an objective sense. He's not saying that that I'm she's not, not. No, what I'm saying is that it, these but... things are these things are so um, they're so convoluted in so many ways. And what it really comes down to is we're people interacting with people, and that needs to be the first, the most important thing. Uh, we need to be giving one another dignity in all the ways that we're interacting. And whether that's the coach to the athletes, whether that's the athletes to each other, it doesn't really matter. But the point here is, is in a sport, we see this so commonly where the idea of giving someone dignity is just, we just leave it out. Whether it's because, you know, making them tougher or whatever, it doesn't matter what we're claiming the reason, or maybe it's not intentional, but um, that should and should always be the most important thing when you're talking about one person to another. Yeah, and I, shame is a powerful motivator, and it's exploited, I think, oftentimes in sports. And Kara Goucher had mentioned that there were not public weigh-ins, but they were weighed in front of each other, and there is this component of shame to try to drive to better performance or to meet expectations. And the exploitation of people's shame, I, I personally feel very strongly about that, that a person should not be shamed to success. Yeah, I mean, we know objectively that those things can work, but that's not the point. It, it, I would sacrifice performance every single time if it means uh, greater dignity is being given one to another. 
So the next one I want to mention is um, a really exciting thing that's going on uh, currently and has been going on for a little while in our area. So in West Michigan, um, specifically Rockford High School, we've My seen, alma mater, uh, the high school I went to. His alma mater and certainly, uh, you know, close to home because that's the school district that uh, we live in. But Erica Vanderlandy has been running well Woo-hoo. for Rockford for years. Um, she won two state championships while running for Rockford. Um and is now running for Michigan, where she is currently ranked number 23 in the country, approaching the regional championships later this week. And uh, very exciting. You know, she's hopefully she can advance on uh, the state or the team rather should advance on to the national championship. Yeah. So certainly best of luck to Erica, both at the regional championships and then, uh, you know, with hope at the upcoming national championships in yeah. the NCAA. Go, Erica. I. I'm excited to share that the Indy Beyond Monumental Marathon went really well for athletes this year, despite the terrible weather. So these are really tough runners. I personally have a few friends that ran this race um, in the half, but I just cannot imagine running in that terrible cold, but they ran amazingly well. So there's 39 people who qualified for the Olympic Trials Marathon, according to a press release from the race. Well, uh, the last one then for the world of running here is just simply at the grand stage, the highest of all stages. Um, They have announced the finalists, five athletes for both male and female athlete of the year for uh, track and field. So that being the case, I just wanted to mention who they are um, and a couple of reasons why that's exciting because there's some Americans certainly on the list. Uh, First, for the women, we've got Shelly Ann Fraser-Price and... Andy has mentioned her in the past. Um, she's yeah. she's been on the top of her game despite uh, you know not necessarily being the youngest sprinter anymore. But uh, so for Jamaica, she's one of the five finalists. Sifan Hassan, who's been one that's kind of exciting to watch for us because she's yeah. she is a distance runner. She did the incredible fifteen hundred and ten k double at World Championships this year and won them both. It's amazing in absurd times. <laughs> She was, it was incredible to see, you know, something both sides of the spectrum, if you will. Um, she's also done many other things too, like the world mile indoor record um, this past incredible year. athlete. Or, sorry, outdoor. That was the outdoor record. Yeah, so she ran four twelve in the mile this past summer too. So that's that's really something. Um, and then Bridget Koske is on the list, of course, after a world marathon record. Um, she also won the London Marathon and the Chicago Marathons. You know, two big ones. So there's good stuff there too. Um, Delilah Muhammad is an American hurdler. Yeah. And uh, so she's, you know, she's done some exciting things. She broke the world record in the 400 meter hurdles at the uh, U.S. Championships um, and then again at the World Championships. She looks so strong when she's doing it. It's amazing. Yeah. It looks like it's on fast forward. Really just incredible to see someone running that fast over hurdles for that long. It's, it's something. And then Yulamar Rojas from Venezuela is also on the list. And she's not one that I'm personally much familiar with, but uh, largely because she's a jumper. And I don't necessarily follow those events quite as closely. But, um, but so we those... do love to watch them at the Olympics. So oh, we'll certainly. try to freshen up before yeah, we'll watch we watch the Olympics. We'll watch them all. But uh, those are your five female finalists. They'll announce the actual winner after some voting and some other things. And uh, once we have that information on hand, we'll certainly share that with you too. And the men, Woo-hoo. we have Joshua Cheptegegi. I don't know how to say his name. <laughs> um, he's Ugandan, and uh, he won the 10,000-meter title at the World Championships, um, which in, in some ways you know, was not necessarily a, an expected winner, but um, he also won World Cross Country, so he's you know got some wins under his belt this year. That's exciting. Sam Kendricks is the U.S. pole yeah, vaulter. I know um, who he is. Absolutely. He won the world championship this year, uh, but it it was really funny. And I think I mentioned this, but the pole vault is a very camaraderie focused event. You know, these guys are competing against each other, but they're also pretty friendly with each other. And you saw that after the championships ended, uh, Sam Kendricks was first and then the second and third place guys joined him on the mat and all three of them. Uh, did a backflip together like on the mat. bouncing yeah. around. It was really, it was really kind of fun. And then they just like sat on the mat for a while, just chatting. You know, it was really cool. So Sam Kendricks, um, personally, I would, I would love to see him win that. That would be exciting. Mm-hmm. Elliot Kipchoge, of course, is on mm-hmm. the list. Not only for the 159, um, which you know can't be a real world record, but certainly is fast. And he did win the London Marathon in a course record as well. Yeah. Which at the time was the second fastest time in a, in a sanctioned event too. So. 
quick. Um, Noah Lyles is the next one on the list. He's also American. He won the 200-meter title. Um, he was on a winning relay. Uh, he, uh, What I think is just fun about him is he loves Dragon Ball Z. He always talks about it in interviews and stuff. So he actually <laughs> like like dyed his hair silver oh, yeah, for, yeah, for yeah. the race. And like, most people are like, oh, that's kind of cool. But it was actually in on purpose because, you know, Goku's highest level when he like levels up, powers up and stuff, his hair turns colors. Well, that's why he dyed his hair silver. So that was well, cool. it worked for him. Oh, yeah. He won. And then Carson Warholm's also on there. He won the 400-meter hurdles. Um, and it, in some ways, that was considered an upset win as well. But he's had a great year, too. So those are the five men, five women. And we'll see who the athlete of the year is by vote. And we'll announce that when it comes. Saying stuff. Let's move on to our main topic. Today's topic is the data that drives us. And data is a conversation around our house because there it's is... very, very exciting for me. Very. He doesn't sound excited, but it is something that very, very much he is paying attention to all the time. Um, so yeah, Zach is a data guy and I am a more uh, fluid approach type person. So uh, this topic of conversation, you're going to get perspectives from both personality types. So yeah, Zach, dive in. Well, so we've got uh, we, we wanted to just kind of talk about what are what kind of data are we talking about as runners when we talk about data, um, set some context here. So certainly the kinds of normal things, you know, like pace, uh, time, distance, heart rate, of course. Some of you run with power now. You're using some some power meters like Stride or something like that. And so power is becoming a data that is more common for cyclists, but we're seeing it in running a little bit. Cadence, definitely, that's a part of things. Relative effort, depending on what you're using, sometimes it gives you real-time data on relative effort. Sometimes you get it after the fact. And race times. I think a lot of people have those as benchmarkers to inform them. Yeah, performance in general. Um, I think there's also some data that, as runners, we don't necessarily often consider when we're just thinking about our immediate context, you know, the running itself. But, you know, data like how much sleep I got last night or my seven-day average or something, um, the temperature of the run at, at that particular time, and especially the temperature of that run compared to the temperature of what I've been running in the last few days. Yeah, absolutely. Our bodies are always having to adapt to that, so... Great to consider. And also, I don't think we often identify all the variables that could be happening at a time. So like if I'm feeling terrible and I tell you all the reasons why I'm feeling terrible, but oh, I didn't mention like I'm pregnant. That's kind of a major variable that's going to affect everything, your pace, your heart rate, your power, your time, your distance, all of those things. So there are variables that sometimes may be obvious that we're just not identifying because we're just so focused on the data right in front of us. So, Andy, use that as a segue then and talk about how you have interacted with data as a runner. My relationship with data is kind of a new one because, like I mentioned um, earlier, I'm a more fluid approach type person. As Zach likes to say, do whatever I want. Um, okay, I, I, I guess I can try to own the part of that that's true. And I should put parameters on that. When I say do whatever you want, I don't mean you just every day wake up and decide, hey, I'm going to go run this hard at this for this amount of time. But like do whatever you want within the context of what your training plan. Like I feel good today. I want to run more of a like fast, faster, not not workout, but like moderate type run. Um, so I, I've always kind of functioned that way. When I feel good, I maybe run the pace a little bit faster than I should. Um, so yeah, recently I've been paying attention. In fact, I'm going to disclose this. Um, you're all going to think I'm like a terrible runner or something, but I have only recently started tracking my mileage um, in the past, like, I don't know, two or three years. And I, in, in college, I did track it because it was part of a spreadsheet that Rod had, but I really didn't know um, after college, like what I was doing. I was just randomly adding miles to my life based on my whimsy. <laughs> it wasn't really based on anything. You just did it. You just ran whatever you felt like. Running. Right. And I was fine for a time. I think it was part of like a lot of um, people do experience burnout. We talked about that in a previous episode. Um, but I do think it is important to have some data like mileage, uh, which I have now realized can inform me about things like injury and some other things that we'll talk about later. But yeah, it's like a, I guess it's like a journal, and when you go back 
and you read it, you can find things out. Like when you're writing them, it's that's healthy too. Like when you're actually fleshing it out and you're writing it down. But then when you go back and you're able to compare things over time, you can really see what's going on. And in that sense, data and goals certainly go hand in hand, um, meaning that, you know, what things I'm paying attention to matter more and less depending on my goals. So even just as you were saying, Andy, you didn't necessarily track much of anything for years. And I think in large part that was because you didn't necessarily have a precise sense of goals that you were chasing after for much of that time. Not to say you didn't have any goals at all, but that certainly wasn't the high priority for you in a lot of those times. Yeah. And I do think, too, that that was okay for that time, except that I think one of the goals that I have recently taken very seriously is staying healthy. And I think it's really hard to stay healthy if you're an ambitious runner without paying attention to your mileage. Right. I would argue, of course, that um, certain kinds of data should probably always matter um, just to just to do something in a wholesome way. To your point, then, Andy. So for me, data has always been a more is better kind of thing. Um, And I say always, but uh, a couple of my college teammates will occasionally laugh at me for this period of time it was it was my senior year and it was the weeks leading up to the national championship in cross country and a couple of my teammates just always thought this was funny that during that time a number of different occasions where someone would be like hey Zach how far are you running today and I would just be like I don't know I'm just gonna go run for a while and they'd be like oh how fast are you gonna run I'm like I don't know I'm just gonna run whatever feels good Um, But of course, there was a reason for that, too, where, you know, in the final weeks leading up to the race, aside from certain workouts the coach had us doing, um, I was really just allowing myself to become totally relaxed in my efforts and in my pursuits um, during those easy runs, just trying to do exactly what my body wanted to do and not not fight it. So for me, data has been a lovely thing. I am a great friend of spreadsheets, as mentioned, and I would spend far too much time on them, especially with running specific data. And the example of that is simply, it was a year ago when I decided I was going to try to track certain data points over the course of different kinds of runs and then compare them against each other. Mostly I was using pace and heart rate, although I was using cadence and some of those things too. And what I was doing was I was cross-referencing pace and heart rate data on a chart for different types of runs and efforts. So if I did an easy run of an hour or more, I was tracking that against other easy runs of an hour or more. And I was doing this for a period of like two or three months where every day, every run, and I was comparing it against similar efforts. And all of it to try to identify what kinds of things should just happen without intent and without, you know, I'm not trying to um, manufacture a result here. But the idea is if you're gaining fitness in an aerobic capacity, then you should see something like pace getting faster while heart rate remains the same and things like that. And so I was curious, do I see the appropriate trends here? Um, And I was noticing interesting things that were fluctuating and influencing those trends, like a given week when I um, spent a lot more time in the car driving for work, I noticed that uh, if I ran at the end of the day, I was seeing a significantly different result, um, you know, slower pace for the same heart rate than if I ran in the morning. Um, and then if I'm looking at a week when I just had a more relaxed work week, then things were different then too. So the data was really informative for me. It was a great experiment. I don't do that all the time. I would if I could, but yeah, you would. But uh, for me, then the trap in in all of this is that I want to believe that certain kinds of data, you know, certain results in data points, certain levels of pacing and heart rate and all these other kinds of things, I want them to mean something objective. Like if I can be X, then I'm this kind of athlete. Um, you know, if I see this kind of data, it means I'm this kind of athlete. And also it, it led to to want to control more variables in your life and some things in life are not easily controlled. Yeah, well, uh, and one of one example of controlling something too much uh, was just for a period of time I was trying to force myself into a very small window for my cadence. I was trying to do 180 steps per minute, um, or as very close to that as I could. So I was literally um, at the time I didn't have I didn't have a watch that gave me cadence data. So I was literally counting my steps as I was running for That's a minute exhausting. at a time. Like oh, that yeah. in and of itself is exhausting. But it was also exciting because I, I, so I was motivated counting. by it. Yeah, I liked it. Wow. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, that's not sustainable. But I did it like I had a, I, I called it um, Form Fridays. 
and it really wasn't about form; it was just about cadence. But um, every Friday when I would run for this period, it was it was like a three month long thing in the winter one time, and I was just tracking that all the time, you know, just ca- counting steps and trying to get it close to 180. And what I did, it did two things for me that were positive. Uh, one was that it helped my body understand what it felt like to run 180 steps per minute, and it also gave me an idea of what it took to manufacture something like that. Um, and in that particular case, my cadence is generally quite a bit slower than that 180. So it took quite a bit of effort to manufacture it, and I was getting sore from it, and you know, it was causing things. And I never saw necessarily a positive benefit. He's got really long legs, so I think that's part of it. And I should say, th- the reason why I did that is because a study came out that said, basically, from the 800 meter up through the marathon at the Olympic level, athletes average 180 steps per minute. That, that was It was a simple conclusion drawn from a ton of research on Olympic athletes in, in the events. And so they basically said 180 steps per minute must be the most efficient cadence. However, two things to remember. First, they said average. It's not like they said every athlete was always running 180. Um, and second, of course, these things are nuanced. Like my stride length generally is quite a bit longer than people because my legs are generally quite a bit longer than most other athletes at my same height um, who are running the same events as me. So, of course, my stride will likely be a bit slower. So all of that being the case, I love data. However, I fall into a trap of um, trying to do things with it that I necessarily shouldn't to the degree that I'm trying. So what we want to try to do here then to kind of get into the topic uh, more objectively is talk about the positives and the negatives of data um, and certainly kind of what what that means for nuances involved in the data as well. So back, going back and seeing my mileage, like I mentioned before, was beneficial for finding trends for injury. I would get to a certain point in mileage and I would get hurt. So having that data has informed me for this previous cycle where I actually got to stay healthy. Yay. Um, there, I mean, there are many variables there, but that was certainly one of them. We knew kind of where my cap was mileage wise and having that log helped me out. Well, and I would say part of the reason why we needed to be very precise with that was not uh, because we were so worried about you getting hurt if we did a little bit too much, as much as we were wanting to do as much as possible so that you could still maintain a decent amount of volume as you were building up for a marathon. So we wanted to do as much as we thought that you could handle and as a consequence needed to make sure we knew how much you were running so that we got as close to that as, as you were comfortable doing while maintaining health. So I think one of the big positives just in general with data is when we know what the data means, um, it really can help us identify things like that, you know, like that kind of a concern. Or on the flip side of that, it can also help us identify things that should build confidence. And the good example there is that, um, Andy, when you were doing the marathon build, we never really did any marathon pace workouts. And for you, that was kind of nerve wracking. You're like, I don't know if I can run that pace for a long period of time. Right. And especially because, you know, the marathon is just it's just a brutal kind of thing, too. So you really want to be confident that you can handle it Mm -hmm. uh, because it'll feel fine in the beginning. But you want to make sure that, you know, you can handle it in the end. Well, of course, uh, we didn't do workouts that necessarily gave you that parameter. However, we did do workouts that we understood what that data was giving us that suggested that you could. And so we, we weren't worried about it. Well. I you you were. I wasn't worried about it. Um, but I worry because, about a lot of things. So Well, yeah. but So because we really took a close look at the data that you had on hand and what it meant, especially once you started actually wearing a heart rate monitor. It took a while to get you to wear a heart rate monitor while you were training this summer. So once you finally did, um, then it gave us a clearer picture of that balance of perceived effort and actual outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. So another one that um, we really find fascinating is just all of the research on how feedback impacts performance. Um, and the one that I just, I love pointing back to this. So in it, working in education, I've spent a lot of time researching feedback in terms of like learning objectives for students. Uh, but the interesting one here has nothing to do with either of these realms, and that's uh, traffic. So you're familiar, if you're listening to this and you live in, especially anywhere near Michigan right now. No, they're doing this all over the place where they're putting up those speed limit signs that actually tell you 
how fast you're driving. It's using a radar, right? So what they're really trying to do is they've done the research that says that if people see their speed in front of them, and especially if that speed is blinking and, sh- and flashing bright lights, if they're going too fast, that people are inclined to slow down, even if they're comfortable with the speed that they're driving. So I could look at it and say, it's telling me I'm driving 31 and a 25 and I need to slow down. It's giving me a flashing light. Even if I say, yeah, 31 is fine. You know, I don't mind driving six over or something. I'm still going to be inclined to slow down yeah. because of that. And that's all the science says. Yeah. Behavioral modification um, is highly likely in these kinds of scenarios. And then, and this is the most fascinating part to me, not only does it modify my behavior in the immediate moment of receiving the feedback, but that behavior modification persists for a period of time after. So if I'm driving down the road and I no longer see that sign, I'm still likely to continue driving more slowly for quite a substantial yeah, it's conditioning. period. conditioning. Exactly. And that's what we're seeing with some of this data in running. But before I try to make that connection, Andy, you had something about Oh, jobs. yeah. So feedback is crucial in a lot of different areas in our lives. So like feedback and job performance, feedback in relationships. I mean, DTR, isn't that the define the relationship? So th- there are conversations in relationships. So like, why not running? Um, it does give us a reflection of what's going on. And I can think I'm ready to go into public, but look in the mirror and see that there's spinach in my teeth and my shirt's on back backwards. Like these are actual things that have happened to me. So I, I think I'm ready to go out. But when I look in the mirror, it tells a different story, and that's kind of what feedback can do for us. Yeah. Um, so the interesting thing with like feedback and relationships in that sense is so often um, we will want feedback, but then we won't want to give feedback. Um, and I guess maybe I'm just speaking personally um, with something like this. Um, so when it's when it's interpersonal, when the feedback is coming from one person to another, then what you have is you have the nuance of the relationship itself informing whether I'm actually willing to listen to that feedback or act upon it. You know, the behavioral change is now being influenced by an interpersonal factor. And that that is you lost dangerous. me a little bit there. Can you <laughs> can you like explain what you just said? Because I don't understand. Yeah. When the feedback is coming from one person to another person instead of from a, a machine blinking a light oh, at us. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So I place greater and lesser authority on what that feedback means depending on its source. And that's a fascinating thing, especially in running. So the example here is if I have a coach telling me something or if I have a watch blinking numbers at me, the science tells us I am more likely to objectively act, behaviorally act upon that watch's data without any thought. I'm just likely to do it versus if even if it's my trusted coach whom I love, if my coach is giving me feedback, even if it's telling me the same thing. So if my watch says your heart rate is 175 and that's too high for this run, then I'm likely to slow down in that scenario. Whereas if my coach says, I think you are running too hard for that run, I'm not quite as likely to slow down. Interesting. Fascinating. So that's the reason why I'm saying that is because that feedback is really actually quite valuable as a runner. Um, and the, so the power there being that it can be so precise. You know, I'm not getting feedback in general. I'm getting very specific data points, my pace, my heart rate, my power, if you're using power, my cadence, and all of those things are very precise data points that all have a slightly different nuance in what they mean for my run. And if I really clearly understand, and this is really the heart of it, by the way, I have to know what that data means for me in that particular moment. And if I do, I can act upon it in such a way um, that is truly valuable. If I don't understand exactly what it means or if I don't have a clear picture of why that data means a certain thing for that run, uh, then it actually becomes quite dangerous. So that might be a good segue into the negatives or potential negatives of the data and that feedback. And I think that first one is kind of what I was articulating there is just, um, you know, if, if I don't, if my perception and my feedback, if they're not aligned, then it can cause problems. It actually can be a positive thing. You know, so if I think that I'm running easy and it's feeling good and then my feedback comes back, whether it's my pace or my heart rate or something, goes back and says, I'm working harder than I should be. Um, you know, that can be a positive thing because it can help measure my effort or help me adjust my effort. But if I'm not necessarily trying to act upon it or I don't, I'm not interpreting the data appropriately, then I can be adjusting my effort in negative ways, potentially harmful or just simply not beneficial. And at the very least, just not beneficial. So I think for me, and this is kind of why I've avoided doing more data collecting, I don't know exactly the word to use for that, is that I can obsess over things. And so um, obsession with figures, I think, is a 
a problem that a lot of athletes run into. I think we're wired to focus on certain elements that we can control. And sometimes we think when something, a data um, point is objective, like when you're getting the flashing lights, when you're getting that the pace and those numbers, we kind of obsess over it to try to control what we can feel like is an uncontrollable situation. So it gives us a feeling of power. And we can focus on that instead of seeing like the general intention for the larger plan. So like I'm feeling bad this day and I get frustrated and I'm I'm looking at all the data points and they are telling me things I don't want to hear and sulking to a place or like not not completing the run based on on the figures is not feeding the larger plan, which is consistency and staying healthy, all of those things that will bring me to the start line or bring me into healthier living. Yeah. And that, so just the nuance, and we keep saying this, but the nuance that surrounds data and objective information really matters. And, um, it, and it's very difficult. It's very difficult to understand exactly because it changes so much. Um, so even just trying to quantify that too much is a problem. Um, and what I mean really by that then is, you know, the way I feel versus what the data is telling me and all of that being influenced by things outside of that particular run, you know, like my sleep and my diet and even my emotional state, all of that stuff. So um, it's never it's never as simple as a single data point. That's kind of the key here. And um, understanding that doesn't necessarily you know, even if I get that, it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to interpret it correctly in a given moment. So it's dangerous to then be relying on that objective data. And I think when we plug in those numbers online and all of those different platforms that we can do, uh, put paces in or put in PRs and see a result pumped out of what we should be expected to do at another distance, that that is also another way of using data to our demise, I think, because I ran a half marathon before the marathon. Um, a lot of people do a tune up race like that. And I was unhappy with the result that it told me I got a PR. And so it's hard to even say this. But in my training, I was hoping for something faster because based on the time that I ran and that half marathon, I wouldn't qualify for the Olympic trials. And that was my goal. So if I were to believe that data, what that told me, that could really play into some mind games for the actual marathon when I towed that line. If I were to say, well, the data told me, this told me, this race um, said that I wasn't going to be able to do it. So, um, yeah, I think that we can also misuse data in that way. Um, and, and ultimately, I think the greatest negative of data is that we, we cling to it. I mentioned just becoming reliant on it, um, but we cling to it to tell us certain things. And without that data, we don't necessarily think we know those certain things. And so the point I really want to make here is that um, I, I believe, I truly believe that all data points, every single one of them mentioned, ultimately become irrelevant if an athlete is um, highly self-aware. Um, if, if I can truly understand myself and all of the influencing factors, how I'm feeling and, um, you know, understanding, even just feeling, feeling my cadence without a monitor telling me what my cadence is, feeling my cadence, feeling my posture and all of those things and being able to adjust them appropriately in a given context. If I can do that, I, then I shouldn't need and I don't need the data. Uh, but because the data is always in front of me, I don't necessarily try to become that athlete. And I think that's a problem. Now, I'll also say on the flip side of that, uh, how realistic is that? Um, you know, because it because it's whether I can do it in one given day doesn't necessarily mean that I'm capable with everything else that's going on in my life if I'm just distracted in other contexts or, you know, other things at play here. Uh, maybe it's not realistic to say we could be a totally self-actualized runner and not need any kind of external feedback to understand um, what I'm doing and how I should be doing it. Maybe that's not true, but I think that is the ideal. And we should always be trying to aspire toward less reliance on the data and more ability to um, inherently understand ourselves in, in while we're running. Yeah, and I think, too, when we've come to race day, Zach and I differed this way in Chicago. I I didn't end up wearing my watch. I didn't have a heart rate monitor. He wanted to have that to analyze the race later. But in my mind, for the race, 
that was the time that I, I was using the data for training and then the race day was race day that I wasn't going to be tied to anything and just go out there and run. So I think that uh, some of us do better with with feedback during race and competition and some of us do better letting that go. And um, I think that's a personal preference. Yeah. And my perspective tends to almost always be I want to have the data at least after the fact, even if I'm not using it to inform me during an effort. Um, but again, to that point, there's there's a liberation that occurs if you're ready for it, if you feel that it's you know a benefit to be able to run without any kind of measure. Um, now, that's, of course, not possible if there's a clock and it's still measuring your time. So there's some measures still. Um, but really, truly, to reduce as many as possible um, can be liberating, can be freeing. So what I want to do here to wrap it up is just really give it kind of my three points, my three takeaways. Um, maybe it was better, maybe, maybe it would be good to start by doing this, but I wanted to wait until the end and just give you kind of what's, so what's the point of all of this? And um, I think it's really three things. First is definitely use the data. You know, we have so many different tools out there to provide us with really accurate, especially if it's accurate, you know, if it's not understand whether or not it's accurate first. But if it is, use the data. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of this Garmin watch that I've got. And, you know, I didn't have any kind of uh, smart watch. You know, it was always just a stopwatch on my wrist kind of thing until just a few years ago. And um, I'm glad that I have it. I, I like the data. I, I like to be able to use it. So do that. Um, however, do it while understanding what it means. You need to understand what the data is telling you in a given moment and what that might be telling you about behavior management. You know, should, should you be changing something about your run? And then the third thing, and really I think the ultimate point, as I said earlier, is the goal here should be to be independent of the data. I think for every runner out there, your ultimate goal should be to know yourself and know yourself without that feedback and data. While it's still good to have it, to strive toward independence. With all this talk about data, you may be wondering, how do I gather this data? What do I use? If you're like me and ran watch lists for many years and don't have that type of, type of technology, we've created something to kind of help you out with that. It's called Gearbag. A to Z running dot com slash Gearbag. And you can find some of the stuff that we use there and recommend. Yeah, it's really all about like the stuff that we like. Um, you know, some of it's stuff that I think Ed, just about anybody out there would say is good stuff, but we're not really trying to go for the best or, you know, the most premier items as much as the ones that we have found useful for various reasons. So yes. we don't give a ton of context. If you want to know more about why we like those kinds of items or the ones listed, just feel free to reach out and we can actually explain more about it. But um, otherwise, or if you're someone listening and you ha want us to try something that you've decided you like, let us know about that. Yeah, definitely. And so you can find anything from like actual shoes and watches and that kind of stuff to recovery, injury prevention, nutrition, any of the stuff that we like to use as runners. Small disclaimer is that we could get a small commission if you do click through our links through Amazon. It's not going to cost you any more to do that, but we want you to find your best deal. So do your research. Really, the idea of it is uh, not to make a bunch of money or anything, but to help inform you about the things that we use and answer those questions that we've gotten from lots of people about the things that we uh, utilize in training. We have a lot of exciting episodes coming up. We have amazing interviews lined up. You're going to want to be along for this ride. I'm sorry that you had to listen to just Zach and me talk about data this week. Oh, we listened to Zach and Andy about data. Um, yeah, so we're going to have some exciting stuff. Please uh, subscribe, share with a friend. And you can find us on social media and like Instagram and Facebook. We are A to Z running or at A to Z running or something like that. I'm sure Andy knows more about it than me. He's correct. And of course, Strava. Find Zach Ripley there. And uh, we would love to hear from you as always. Have a good one, everybody. See ya. I'm Batman.